One day I was walking to school when a man tried to force me into a car where another man was waiting. I kicked and screamed, people on the streets rushed to help me, and they eventually let me go. My family and I left Iraq the next day. A local militia had threatened the Associated Press where my dad was a reporter. The militia was upset with recent coverage of its activities and ended up murdering his colleague and lodging a bullet in the head of his three-year-old son. After the shock of what happened to me wore off, my parents joked that kidnappers changed their minds after being exposed to what I was like as a teenager. This is the kind of humor that Iraqis are known for. The darker, the better. And it's one reason that Ahmed al-Bashir, the country's most influential media figure, has managed to capture the hearts of Iraqis. Half of Iraq's total population regularly tunes into his show. Al-Bashir was born and raised in Ramadi, Iraq, which experienced the worst of the Iraq war. He lost several family members, including his brother and father. In 2005, he was kidnapped and tortured by a Shia militia. 16 years later, al-Bashir has built a remarkably successful show by criticizing the Iraqi government and its corruption. I spoke to al-Bashir at the Oslo Freedom Forum, a conference that gathers media figures, activists, and dissidents to talk about government oppression and human rights violations all over the world. Al-Bashir and I talked about the situation in Iraq and the Iraqi elections. Mm -hmm. They say before Saddam, we have one Saddam. Now we have a thousand Saddam. Every corner in Iraq, there is a small dictator. And whoever says anything about him, he would be killed publicly. I wanted to joke about escaping my kidnappers, but I thought it might be inappropriate since he couldn't escape his. You think that was funny? I think that's fun. I think it's hilarious. I'm going to just go ahead and, you know, welcome you to Reason. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, I'm really excited to talk about, you know, the future of Iraq. So we, I know we've gone over like a lot of things where I look online and everything that I see about Iraq, it's more of like what happens in the past and how it's affecting, um, the future currently. And I'm interested in seeing what the future is going to look like for Iraq. Um, I left Iraq in 2005 uh, during the first elections. I didn't even get to see the elections. I left, I think, a week before the elections. You, you missed a very beautiful thing. I saw it on the road that it was it was a good time to leave as we were it was leaving. Very good time <laughs> yes. to leave. Yeah. So as we were leaving Iraq, I throughout the whole trip, you know, every day I was like, oh my god, like if there is a time to leave, like this is a good time. Um, so my questions to you are. You know, what has changed since then? By the way, 2005 elections, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, um, it's, it's, again, it's my pleasure to, to be with you. Um, 2005 elections is much better than 2021 elections. Although there was security issues, there were problems, and, and people were choosing according to their sex and religion. Uh, but at least we had the sense of democracy. That was the beginning, 2005. Then 2010's election also was, was very good elections, I would say. There was, there was a fraud. There is no elections in Iraq without a fraud. But people participated in it in a huge numbers, actually. I would say 75% of Iraqis went to vote in that elections. Um, the future of Iraq depends on the, on the democracy system, the whole thing, the whole process, not only elections. Unfortunately, we are just, they're giving them, the Iraqis, only the elections without anything else. So when you get that, you get dictators. Not one, like uh, several dictators. There is a, what you call clip, kleptocracy, I guess. It's the right, correct. Uh, so when you say, say you, when you give them elections, you mean like the, the only part where Iraqis get involved is, is the voting, like when they actually yes. have to go vote. Exactly. And beyond that, there's no information about who. Who are they voting for? What kind of, you know, reforms these new people might make in Iraq? How are they different than the people before them? That's not something that, you know, Iraqis are exposed to prior to any, election, any elections. Actually, the candidates themselves now, the, this election, 2021, uh, not a single of them has a program, like political program. He's, he wants to go to the parliament uh, to vote for, uh, uh, to be part of the process of the parliament. Uh, but he thinks himself and he, he, he um, how do we say it? Present himself. Present himself okay. 
present himself as he's a local uh, uh, local council member he said he promised them that he will um, uh, build them roads uh, and establish schools for them although it's not his job uh, as a parliament member to build roads for the people or to build hospitals or, or uh, schools okay the the whole parliament maybe when they choose a government then they will do it they don't understand the political system. They don't understand why they are going to the parliament. Uh, I'm going to go pause you just for a second because mm-hmm. I, I know the Iraqi like um, election process is, a, is is different than you know the process in the U.S. Like in the U.S., it's a two party system. You vote for you know who your president will be by by voting for the president yeah. before the elections. Mm-hmm. Will you elaborate on how the Iraqi elections work because they're very different? That's the thing that I want to talk to you about. So in 2010, Iraqis thought when we vote for a bigger bloc, this bloc will, 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 will form the government, the new government. So we got Ayad Allawi winning with 91 seats in 2010. Nur al-Maliki uh, was the second place, 89. So technically the constitution says the bigger bloc the winner in the, in the elections will form the new government. And by bloc you mean the bigger party? The bigger bloc, not the party, you know, not one party. So what is it's the coalition? Bloc? It's a coalition of yes. parties, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, the Iraqi, mm-hmm. the Iraqi won with ninety-one seats in the parliament. So basically, they are the winners according to the constitution. They are the winners. Ayat Allawi should be the prime minister because that's what they wanted to present at that time. Then Joe Biden and uh, um, Iraq, the Tehran, DC and Tehran decided that, no, we're going to choose Nur al-Maliki over Ayad Allawi because we think that Nur al-Maliki is more Shia than Ayad Allawi. Ayad Allawi also was Shia. Uh, and they, then Iraqis felt that, so if we're voting and we're going to the elections and we support someone or support, support some party, and then DC and Tehran decides who's going to be the prime minister, why would, would we go from the first place? to give some people more seats and give them some more money. That's when the Iraqis lost faith in democracy. That's when the Iraqis thought that there is no point of going to the elections anymore. And uh, Nur al-Maliki became prime minister. And you've seen what happened because of losing faith in democracy. The, you, we had ISIS. Before ISIS, we had protests, big protests. On 2014 also, there was elections. And the same thing happened also. Nur al-Maliki won. But Nur al-Maliki didn't become the prime minister. And then you got also, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2018, um, Muqtada Sadr won. And he didn't get the prime minister. And then we got uh, the protest of 2019. So they don't understand that people lost faith in democracy in Iraq because of the people who brought democracy to Iraq. They they were the reason of of why people lost faith in democracy. Let's talk about this a little bit because I think that I'd like to explain to like most Americans like how the the new Iraqi government was formed. So when uh, the U.S. established, when the U.S. entered Iraq, there was a period of time where do you remember we didn't have a government, Mm -hmm. and it was the best time. The the I think it was 2003. There was no Iraq, there was no government at all. It wasn't the best time actually. Really? It was the best time in, in Basra. It was amazing. I really? don't know what happened like with you guys, but like there was no government in Basra. Uh, we had like there were, you'd go in the streets and then you'll see a person on the street like getting out of his car and like directing traffic and like, Oh yes, get, yes, yes. Remember yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, remember. And then people go back to their car and they start to drive and like you get traffic again and then somebody else gets out of the car and, then... and you go to one of Saddam's palaces and take whatever you want. And yeah, go home. it was like it was like a, yeah, it was it was everybody freedom. was like you finally got yeah, you got you got freedom. There was no safety, but you got 100% freedom. Mm. So then there was a formation of the government and the way it worked it was we had multi-party system, right? So we had multiple parties that were participating in the elections. And I think there was halfway through, I think the uh, you realize that if you vote for a party, even though it's it was presented in a sectarian matter in a way. Yeah. So will you please will you talk about like how did that play out through like talk to me like if I had known nothing about the Iraqi elections, how does it work or how was it established? So in Iraq, the elections is different from the U.S. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to an American person now. Yes. 
In Iraq, we vote for parties, and these parties go to the parliament, and then in the parliament, they decide who is the president of Iraq. And then the president decides who is the prime minister of Iraq. First of all, the parliament chooses the speaker of the parliament, then they choose the president, then the president chooses the prime minister. Here, in this process, it's not very easy, because then you will have people blackmailing other people, people bribing people. People threatening people because it's not democracy. It's actually the mafias. And these mafias are controlling the country now mm -hmm. in, 2010, in 2021. But before, no, it was a little bit different, a little bit. And in the parties, um, there was a realization, for example, like a lot of the parties that were participating in the directions like early on were like parties that were brought on by the U.S. Like there was yes. a Dawa party, there is better. and. And yeah, there was like a kind of most like, of most of them are, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, there was a process where the Iraqi parliament would, oh, the Iraq, those parties realized that they cannot win uh, seats, they cannot win the elections unless they they kind of have to form what you called blocks, right? Yeah. So for example, you can end up with a, with a if we were talking about the, the way it was set up for in terms of sectarianism, you can end up with the Sunni presidents if those parties were fragmented and people just voted for them separately. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No. So like if you were, if, if like the bloc was not together, for example, if okay. Hezbollah Dawa ran on its own, uh, Faluk Badr ran on its own, I don't know what it's called now, but at the time. Badr, yes, Badr. Badr. Mm. And you got like, for example, the Sunni parties, you know, in one coalition, yes. so they could win the elections because they got the most, they got most, the most votes. No, it's not possible. How is it not possible? Because they, um, you know, the seats of the provinces, mm -hmm. it was chosen that every province, according to the uh, number of the people who are living in that province okay. and city. And we don't have statistics, so we don't know until this moment how mo how many people lives in uh, Baghdad, for example. Okay. They say it's a, yeah, any, approximately eight million, but it's mm -hmm. not eight million. No one knows how much. Okay. Uh, how many people? Sorry. Uh, and in Mosul, for example, there are also thirty-two uh, seats for the parliament because they say it's approximately three million, but it's not three million. Um, until this moment, we don't have real statistics about the Iraqis who are living uh, in Iraq. And no one is able to do this. Uh, uh, ihsa. Yes, this, uh, uh, census. Ihsa yeah, yeah, census. Census. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not allowed for the Iraqi government to make uh, the census because Iran is refusing that completely. Okay. And uh, um, if you can create... Uh, so uh, every coalition will win in his provinces only. The other coalition will win anyways in his provinces also. So that's the problem. Uh, you can't ever have something moderate. Except in 2010, we got al Iraqiya. I'm not defending, actually, I don't like Ad al at all. I think he's coward and he escaped and he left responsibility and he just he's looking for money and he, he's inheriting his, his legacy to his daughter. Talk a little bit about Al-Araqiyah, like what happened with it? He won the elections and then what did he do? Uh, he won the elections and he wanted to be the prime minister. Uh, okay, you like him, you don't like him, but he won. You should support him to become the prime minister. Um, there was conflict between Iraq, Iran and, and DC and there was conf uh, Iran and the US. There was conflict between uh, um, many, many uh, parties inside Iraq. And then they said, okay, let's go for a new uh, explanation for the constitution. Uh, the constitution says the winner block will form the government. They say no. They said no. The winner block after the first uh, session of the parliament, then you form a new block. This block will form the government. And it wasn't like that before. So they changed the constitution yes. after elections. They didn't change the constitution. They, re re they reinterpreted the constitution. Exactly. After so the that's election. when Iraqis were like, so you mean whatever I do according to this constitution, they go and explain it in another way, the way that they interest them? I'm not going to be a part of this. What did Awad Allah do when this was when this happened? What did his uh, block do? Uh, they promised him that he became a strategic council president, but they didn't do that. So he boycotted the 
He left, right? Didn't he leave? He didn't left. He actually, okay. they wanted him to become, then he became pro, uh, vice, vice prime minister, I guess. Okay. No, Yes, vice. Okay. No, no, vice president. Okay. And then they, they cut, send, yeah, him, then he send left. him home. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so when you talk about, explain a little bit when you talk he about. Leave. They sent him home. They sent him home. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'll make sure that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, um, when you talk about when you say things like Iran and 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 the and DC decided, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that because you know they don't really like, you know, Tehran is not meeting with DC inside Iraq. So what do you mean by that? And I, and I know what you mean. You mean like there's influence within Iraqi parties, you know, from Iran, and then there is a pushback from the U.S. on, you know for Iraqi influ- or for Iranian influence in Iraq. Um, so I would like for the average American to understand what you mean when you say that, you know, DC and, you know, Tehran decided that this person might not be suitable to rule Iraq. So D- Tehran is controlling lots of parties in Iraq and political parties. Tehran is controlling um, the smallest uh, positions inside the government institution. Uh, everything is connected somehow uh, to Tehran eventually. Uh, the budget, um, uh, the gas, like for example, we can't, we can't produce gas now in Iraq because Tehran is preventing that because we buy gas from them. And this is the only way for them to get, to get the U.S. dollars because they are now on, on sanctions. Um, for example, we can't uh, produce, uh, 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 we can't work, uh, uh, establish factories because Tehran is depending on selling uh, merchandise to Iraqis, and this is the only way to get the U.S. dollars from Iraq, and they are not allowing us to establish to establishing factories. How would they make sure of that happens? They bring some people to the Ministry of uh, of Sanaa Mahadin, the Ministry of. Uh, I don't even know what to call that in uh, <laughs> infrastructure. Let's call it infrastructure. Yeah, infrastructure. Yeah. Make sure they make sure someone is loyal to them. Okay. And when, when and he's corrupt in the same time, and when he tries, when you go to him and ask him, why don't you build factories? He say, well, yes, we can't do that. Delay, delay, delay. And they will never build factories. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that there is those parties that were kind of brought in, you know, by the U.S. actually, after the war. Then they switched Iraq, sides to Iran. They were, they were loyal to Iran. Yes. And you think that the U.S. sanctions... Well, actually, Al-Maliki is a perfect example for that. Okay, Al-Maliki... Talking was a very close friend to the Americans. He was very close friend to Bush, and they thought he's the guy who we can trust uh, to, to, to take over Iraq. And then after, after the American withdrawal, he uh, openly started to support militias. He openly started to support Iran. And he openly became sectarian. So that's why uh, people of provinces, some provinces in Iraq, they felt that there was something wrong with, with him. Why is he doing that now? He destroyed the Sahwa, he destroyed the... Uh, Sunni politicians, and he started, he started to use a sectarian accent with the people. And he escalated a lot. And that's when almost we got sectarian war in 2014 because of al-Maliki. Every party who, who was close to the U.S. became close to Iran and because they, they thought that, okay, the Americans left now. We have only Tehran. So we need to stay with Iran. Mm-hmm. And we need to be loyal to Iran. And that's what they've done to make sure that they keep their positions. So you think there was a misjudgment um, from the Americans for bringing these parties in the first place to Iraq to the, to the electoral process? Yes, starting from Ahmed al-Chalabi, for example. Yeah, that, yeah it's, that's... Do you want to talk about him a little bit? So we have They some thought that Ahmed al-Chalabi has the support of the majority of Iraqis. When he comes, he will be just like Khomeini when he got to Tehran in 1979. Uh, to be honest, I think uh, uh, a thousand Iraqi from all the Iraqis in Iraq knew who Ahmed al-Chalabi was. No one knows Ahmed al-Chalabi. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know who he was. No, yeah. no one knows who <laughs> Ahmed al-Chalabi. When he got there, okay, there is al chalabi factory for flour. We know yeah, that. <laughs> that's. I mean, I I I've heard the name and yeah. of a, a tribe, but that's like all I I've I've heard of it. But I don't. I that person had like no significant in Iraq. Uh, I want to go back a little bit to the part where you talked about Iran and and how Iran has interest in um, Iraq not having, for example, producing its 
or not having infrastructure or producing its own goods or even um, using its own oil. And you you talked about how the U.S. dollars, because there are sanctions on Iran, yeah. Iran has interest on in keeping Iraq in a way unstable because it relies on you know, a supply from Iraq for the U.S. Mm. dollar. Will you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, so Iran is, is I would say, 70% is uh, depending on, they're dependent on getting the U.S. dollars from the Iraqis, from Iraq government. There are several ways of that. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, selling gas to the Iraqi government. One of them is that they sell everything to Iraq, uh, from matches to cars. It's like Iraq's China. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the same thing. Uh, um, uh, Iraq is 40 million, almost 40 million person. I, no one knows, but I would say 40 million. And um, uh, most of the public budget is, is comes comes from selling oil. 95% of the public budget comes from selling oil to the to the world, and then we get the dollars from the U.S. banks. So the only way for Tehran, the only way that Tehran survived the sanctions was through Iraq, uh, through selling gas to Iraq, through selling merchandise. And through also trafficking and through, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Tahrib. Uh, yeah, you, you, trafficking. Yeah, trafficking. Smuggling. Smuggling, yes. Smuggling and selling drugs to Iraq and everything. So uh, this, this is the way that how they survived the sanctions and how they stayed mm -hmm. the whole time without being affected very much by the sanctions. Because Iraq, they call it in Iraqi, in, in Iraqi language, they say, that Iraq is the lung for the Iranians mm -hmm. in, in, according, in the economy section. Mm -hmm. That's because the U.S. government giving the Iraqis dollars. Like uh, we're almost all, uh, we're, we're allies with the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the Iraqis giving away the dollars to the Iranians. That's how. Uh, and the U.S. knows. Everyone knows, but not no one is doing anything about it. And um, uh, we're still there, uh, stuck with, with, with no abil ability uh, uh, to, to, to have fish, fish farms, mm -hmm. with no ability to have corn, for example, mm -hmm. because everything is almost banned from the Iranians. You want to get flour, uh, sorry, you, get, you want to get uh, potato, mm -hmm. you have to get it from Iran. So it's not allowed for you as Iraqi to plant so much potato that covers all the Iraqi region or the Iraqi country. It allows you to plant some. So there are regulations now on agriculture in Iraq? Yeah, there's regulation by the Iranians on, on almost everything. You can't produce anything. How is that? Is, are you talking about through influence, through the party? Through influence and okay. through militias. Okay. And through, like for example, two years ago, one year ago, Iraq almost had enough um, uh, supplies of al uh, Wheat. Wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the Minister of Agriculture went on TV and he said, we will cover the all Iraq needs of wheat. Mm -hmm. Two days later, most of the wheat farms in Iraq burned. No one knows how. No one knows why. And you could see farmers crying because they lost almost everything they got. And then we, go, we imported uh, wheat. Guess from where? Iran? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what's happening. That was a hard question, but yeah. I think I got it. <laughs> and and fish, for example. You can't raise fish inside farms in Iraq mm -hmm. in a big amount because one, when, once you do that, suddenly you will find the fish floating and dying. You don't know how. You don't know why. So why do you think Iran has such strong influence within Iraq? And I, I, know, I know this like argument with like like they're Shia and then Iraq is majority Shia. But it's not about that. Yeah, because Iraq, I think people don't understand that Iraq and Iran, what's the, what's the percentage of Shia in, our, in, in Iraq? Like no 70, one knows. No one but knows. It's, it's above 70, right? No one, no one can tell you the real But number. it's above 50. I can't say. Well, Wait, it's, I don't, okay, I all right, yeah, it's fine. But <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll find the numbers, but I think it's 78 or I, I'll check this, but... Mm. It's, it's a majority Shia country that went to war for eight years with Iran. So 30, 50, uh, 350,000 Iraqis were killed. Yes, and like you can't say that they, they're allied because who fought the war? Like it's the Shia in Iraq yeah, must yeah. have fought the, yeah. the, you know, the Shia in Iran. So I guess my, my question is that I, like, I, I grew up in Basra, it's a majority Shia you know, um, 
city and I don't think people around me had any loyalty to to Iran like we're I think most of Iraqis have like very strong like alliance to Iraq but I do agree with you that these parties have very strong alliance to Iran from like what I've experienced what I continue to see on TV so where does that come from it comes from the militias but what, why are these militias have such strong influence in our, and inside Iraq when Iraqis don't really... If, if you are a mafia leader and you have a mafia members with you and you want to get money and control and power and you get a country like Iran support you and you are in another country like Iraq and this country supports you like the whole thing, whatever you need, this country will provide for you. You need intellig- information, you need uh, arm, uh, arms, you need... Uh, guns you need uh, boats you need tanks they will provide that for you mm-hmm. then you will have to be loyal to them and then they use the religion and sect to uh, to make it a little bit more uh, you know uh, legal uh, not legal how to say uh, shari um, yeah yeah sure, uh, yeah legal, legal, works. Say legal. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these militia members all of them were were they're they're nothing mm-hmm. eventually they're nothing they are not uh, uh, like doctors or they're not uh, inventors they're just gang members and they found they found country to support them why wouldn't they go and they're applying everything that iran wants so there is uh, 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 there is interest between the both sides Mm -hmm. and these militias are the, the the biggest risk for iraqis now it's biggest risk that i believe these militias are protecting the the corrupt parties if you uh, remove the militias from the equation in Iraq, mm-hmm. you will have parties very easily to, to remove or to bring to justice. Mm-hmm. For example, one of the militia leaders uh, was captured by the Iraqi government um, th- five or six months ago. That's a very interesting, I thought would have been, like I've never heard like somebody is captured by the Iraqis. Mean, yes. That's, yeah, that's an interesting statement. Very interesting. Because it's usually the militia captured somebody in the Iraqi government. Or executing. Yeah, okay. So the Iraqi government captured some of the, one of the militia leaders. His name is Qasim Muslah. Because there was a, 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 there was a, a, a lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit against him saying that he's a terrorist. And he killed one, two, three, and he, there is confession, and everything is like the case closed. So they captured him. The militias infiltrated the green zone. They threatened the government. They threatened the prime minister. And they threatened, and they got also political parties, big political leaders in Iraq supporting them. And they pressured the government, and then they released him. Mm-hmm. Because they can't do that. It's bigger than the government. The government and the Iraqi army and security forces need the support of the communi- international community mm-hmm. to stand against these militias if they want that. Okay. Now, here's my question for you. Do you think Iraq... Do you think the U.S. freed Iraq? Or do you think, you know, the oppression of one person has been, like, switched to the oppression of militias inside Iraq? So we had one, you know, if you're pro or against Saddam or whatever, that's, that's in the past... But do you think the that the U.S. made the problem in Iraq worse by importing militias to yes. rule Iraq mm-hmm. that you you ended up from having one dictator to hundreds yes. of militias? And in my opinion, that's more localized and that's scarier because these people have local knowledge into being able to target actual individuals they can identify and and find people much quicker than a dictator can and in, in, in the past yeah. um, so speak a little bit about that how is how is the problem in iraq has gotten worse for iraqis i can't add more than than you said no, that was I perfect <laughs> <laughs> but in iraq we have this saying they mm-hmm. say before saddam we have one saddam now we have a thousand saddam mm-hmm. we had one or day now we had thousands of or days there is lots of sons of, of politi- politi- politicians and, uh, and uh, militia leaders who are acting like Uday and worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have dictators now everywhere. Every corner in Iraq, there is a small dictator. This dictator controlled this. And whoever says anything about him, he would be killed publicly. Mm-hmm. And no one will talk about it. 
And the government will be like, yeah, okay, it's just a, a criminal thing and we can't do anything about it. So uh, Iraqis didn't ask for democracy uh, at 2003. Iraqis didn't ask for the American coalition forces and the American and the coalition forces to come invade Iraq and remove Saddam. I believe Iraqis would have done that later on. But with this kind of, of changing the regime, that was the, a huge mistake. And then they brought uh, even worse people on us. Uh, so the problem is it's, it's not fixed. It's, it's got bigger than, than it was. At le when you ask Iraqis, they say, at least we got security at that time. At least we got some kind of dignity. Now anyone with, with, black, suit, with black suit and black mask can, can uh, break into my house and take me and kill my family. That's why I can't step inside Iraq since 2010, 11, sorry. I left 2011 and until now, mm -hmm. just because I make jokes on TV, just because I laugh of what they're doing wrong. If that was 10% democracy, I would be in Iraq and say whatever I want to say. So it's just a big play, big game they're playing. And everyone is part of this game. And everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. That's why Iraqis are not participating in the next elections. Yeah, talk about how Iraqis boycotting the elections. Because yeah. I know, like, in the U.S., we had, like, the elections that just passed. And it was, like, it was, the, the theme was it was vote on both sides. It yeah. was, like, I'd, I've never seen the word vote as many times I've seen it in, like, last, well, a year. How is that different in Iraq? Cause because it's, it's, the, it, there's a different message. People here trust the, the system or trust the voting procedures, let's say. That's why they want to vote. So I, if I go to vote, and I know that my parliament member won't be able to do anything because there is militias, there is guns, there is corrupt corruptions, corruption and corrupt, uh, uh, po uh, corrupt politicians also. Mm -hmm. Why would I vote to send my candidate inside the parliament? And I know later on, even he will be threatened by the militias, or be killed by the militias, or uh, be corrupted by the money uh, of the corrupt parties, or he will be an, an exile just like, for example, we, we voted for two, mm -hmm. not me, like, we voted for two uh, pa uh, parliament members, uh, Faiq al-Sheikh Ali, mm -hmm. for example, and um, Basim Khushan. Okay. Faiq al-Sheikh Ali, uh, in the middle of the term, he left. He said, I, I can't do anything anymore. I did everything. And I, I said everything and I'm leaving. Uh, this system is not fixable. Mm -hmm. Basim Khushan won the election. He was the highest, the highest uh, uh, person who gets, gets votes in, uh, in, in his province. They didn't allow him to, to go inside the parliament. And until this moment, since 2018, he can't step in the parliament because the political elite uh, they don't accept him. They say, this guy is dangerous. If he comes inside, he will expose us. Although he won the elections. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure they tried to bribe him, tried to threaten him, and that didn't work for them. And I'm not saying that he's great. I'm just saying that mm -hmm. it's an example. And uh, he's, not, he's not a parliament member until this moment. Although he won the elections. So why would I be part of this? Iraqis are thinking like this. Why would, be, would we be part of this game they call elections? It's a game, it's nothing we can do. They, uh, I, I, I always say that. It's their game, it's their election, it's their minister, ministries, it's, the, it's, it's theirs. It's not us, not the Iraqi people. It's a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. We have to confess this is a, a different kind of dictatorship where we can't do anything about it and we can't fix it with democracy. So I just need the world to understand this is not a democracy. What happens in Iraq is not a democracy. You can call it anything, but definitely not a democracy. And this is a different scene from 2005 because people are choosing not to go vote this year. Well, in 2005, people were getting bombed at like elections. And they went. Yeah, and they went. I remember there was an election center by my house that got bombed and there were the people who died and they cleaned up and then they opened again yeah. and then people went to vote. They lined up like nothing happened. They sacrificed to go to the elections Yeah. Uh, at the beginning. 2005, 2010. Then 2014 goes down 2018. 18% of Iraqis went to, to the elections. And this 18% are, 
are the people who are supported by by the parties or supporting the parties who are, who are, have interest with the parties you know because there is 7 million em- employees in Iraq and there are lots of people who work for the parties and work for the government and, and militias so these the 18 percent are the people who got interest from the parties majority of Iraqis they didn't vote mm-hmm. although I was encouraging Iraqis to go to the elections in 2018 and I believed that these elections, if Iraqis were, were uh, they 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 uh, they went to the, to vote, mm-hmm. it would be some kind of change because the prime minister was a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Now I totally believe there's no point why we're doing these elections. So what, they're gonna stay the same. They're gonna, they, they, they they will just change the prime minister to someone else. So how what do you think the future holds for Iraq? What how are we gonna move beyond this? You can't have just eighteen eighteen percent of people showing up for elections i'm assuming the next cycle I think, might be I think worse this year will be less it'll be less okay yeah. so what's what's the way forward for iraqis where do you see them in uh, terms of you know achieving some sort of representation in the government the majority of iraqis now understand what the, what, what the political system is the majority knows that this is what they want. this is not what they want uh, the majority especially the new generation the young people understands that uh, if they want to change, they have to create their own parties and they have to go through uh, real democracy. They always say that we need the support of the international community to do that. For example, on 2019, on the protests, they launched a hashtag uh, says, uh, save the Iraqi people. Uh, they wanted the world to see what the, what this system is who are they the iraqis you know okay the so they're like they're just organizations inside iraq no no just people like, okay yeah all protesters right. people uh, people all around the world uh, all these people wanted the international community to pressure on the government keep pressure on the uh, more uh, to to start the pressure on the government and the political elite to provide uh, a real democracy for them but the world did nothing because uh, uh, since the oil is, is being delivered to the tanks, they don't care. Do you think the U.S. presence in Iraq makes this any worse or better? Or what do you think about the, the current U.S. presence in Iraq? It's, there are no combat forces anymore. Uh, there are training forces in Iraq. To be, to be honest, that, that's, that's the last problem that we talk about in Iraq. Okay. Only militias are talking about the U.S. presence because... They want to take over the country when, once the Americans are leaving. Mm-hmm. So lots of Iraqis think, lots of Iraqis that I meet, thinks that the bases of the Americans, are, it's okay, let, let them stay. There's lots of countries with the American bases. Don't, don't you think, though, that with, with the bases in Iraq are different, though? Because they are specifically training Iraqi forces. They're involved, into, they're involved in the Iraqi government, which is... A little bit different than just having a base, like let's say yes. in Qatar or whatever. Yes. Do you think having a base, like having U.S. bases inside Iraq, might give the sense that Iraq is not sovereign, and then it's it's somehow feeding all these other countries to be involved by influencing? Well, if the U.S. can do it, why can't Iran do it? Why can't? And if the Iran do it, why U.S. can't do it also? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's, it's, do you think, but, you know, Iraq, Iran didn't have that much influence in Iraq until, um, Iran didn't have a lot of influence in, in Iraq, yeah, until mm. the U.S., you know, invaded Iraq, yeah. right? Mm. So, you know, the U.S. invasion, you know, to Iraq. That's why lots of Iraqis says Iran and, and the U.S. are agreed to destroy Iraq. I'm sure you have. You've heard I'm, that. I mean, I I, do, I don't know if I agree yeah. or disagree, but no, I, no, no. I see. Yeah, 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 I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I don't know if what I'm. I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you think the U.S. presence in Iraq makes the problem worse by saying yes? Well, if if the U.S. does it, why can't Iran does it? Well, if Iran does it, why can't the U.S. does it? And and in in that, we're just saying that Iraq is not so, sovereign. It's like these entities have to like somehow intervene to make it a country. Because the Iraqi people are not... I, I would say that when we don't have militias, when there is no militias that support, uh, supported by Iran. How do you think we can get rid of the militias? I think this is the, the task for the Iraqi government. Okay. The Iraqi government should be supported by the international community, and then they get rid of militias, just like what happened in 2008. But they, I, I feel like Iraqi government has been supported by the international community, but the, the current government itself is corrupt. So how do you make sure that 
you know, the government is not corrupt because the international community right now is supporting a corrupt government, right? There will be not a single government. Who are so you're not saying corrupt. there will be a change. If the militias are gone, then there will be a proper government. You're not talking about the current government. You're, you're hoping for a better government. Yes. Okay, that yes. makes sense. Yes. Okay. Um, but the problem is, uh, these militias will decide who are going to be the next government. So you'll never have a better government. So what do you think will so happen? Maybe one government comes, for example, this government now. Mm -hmm. The international community pressured them to take steps to get rid of militias somehow. I don't know how. Bribe them, put them in jails. It's not my problem. It's not my task. <laughs> it's, uh, okay. Not me to, right. to change, to, to decide how. And then uh, you, you will have uh, maybe a country. What do the Iraqi people really want? What they wanted when they went on, on the streets in 2019. What did they want? They said, we want a country. We want a homeland. Homeland is the big, big umbrella which concluded everything. Concluded dignity, freedom, democracy, um, a future, um, a country where we can uh, put our, st our, our foot in and we can stay here and we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, when I open a small business, I know what's going to happen. When I open a restaurant, I, I won't be worried from the militias to come to be my partner. Uh, when uh, when there is something wrong, I go to the court to to um, uh, to comply against someone, and then he goes to jail according to the law. Mm -hmm. um, the the homeland means everything. That's why they went on the streets to tell the world, not the Iraqis, to tell the world that we want a homeland because they had enough uh, with what's happening with this political elite, mm -hmm. and that protests was against the Iraq government and the Iraqi political elite. Yes. But it was a message for the world. That's why they tried to send these peaceful messages to the world, sending, telling them that we are getting killed and we are dying here by the government and the militias and we are doing nothing in, in, in return because we want you to see us that we are not Ba'athis, we are not militias, we don't hate the world, we love the, we want to live peacefully. That's why we are dying and we are doing nothing in return. Mm -hmm. They were painting the walls, they were... Uh, 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 there was graffiti all around Tahrir Square. They were singing, they were dancing. They wanted the world to see them as human mm -hmm. beings. They wanted them to see that these people just are looking for a good life. Mm -hmm. How can we help them to have a, a better life? And if that wouldn't happen in the future, I would say, there will be millions of Iraqis who will be desperate of, of Iraq, and then they will find hope somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They will definitely go everywhere in the world. So we will have maybe a big wave of immigration in the next few years if they couldn't uh, find a solution for Iraq. That's a really interesting... That's why it's very big responsibility for the international community. Um, I, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but uh, there's this image of Iraq that's like not really, not a reality of what Iraqis are, because I think the world looks at Iraq as like these Sunnis, Shia, not and anymore. the Kurds, and it's like they're fighting with each other because they want Shia and want the rule, and like the Sunnis, you know, are the minority now, we have to grant their rights, and and I don't think the average Iraqi cares. Like there, there is no like. It, do you think Iraq is divided? Like Not anymore. Iraqi people. Two thousand six, yes, they were. Now, no. They understood. They knew what the game is. They knew that these political elites just keep dividing them to stay in power. Mm -hmm. They are doing that. They are covered. They they are uh, hiding behind their their sects and religion just to stay in power forever. So they understood that game. That's why when they went on Tahrir Square and the other city and other major uh, squares in, in the major cities, they were out there to say that we are Sunnis and Shias and we are one. There is no difference. We just need a homeland. We, no, we want a government that treats us all like a, a citizen from the first degree. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you with that. It's, and I think even right after the war, I think there was some sort of like a, an organized, some sort of, you know, organized civil war in a way because the war ended in 2003, right? And we didn't have a civil war no. until 2005. We six. hated each six. Yeah, six. end of 2005, early 2000. It was right after the election. February 2006. Yeah. So uh, things started to get worse though in around November 2005. I don't know if 
Or, yeah, yeah it's, somewhere. It's, yeah. Yeah. And, but Iraqis were pushing that away. Yeah, but like for two years, two plus years, we... Because we, the Americans, when they come, they divided... Um, sectarian, uh, sectarianism. Yeah. Yeah. They divided people. So people uh, suddenly started to realize like, what? Well, I'm not Iraqi. Oh, I'm Shia. Oh, wait, I'm not. I'm Sunni. I didn't know that. I know. Oh, he's defending me because he's Sunni. They realized then they were like, what? what what's, got, what's happening? We're both Iraqis. Why we are killing each other? Mm-hmm. Then they stopped one year after. Mm-hmm. They didn't talk, take very long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was... It was interesting to me to see that unfold and to come here and hear that too. Like there, it was, I I honestly didn't know what Sunnis and Shia were until I was like, I think on the eighth grade or something. Like it was, it was very like, it's it's like it it was mentioned one time that somebody celebrates a holiday and somebody doesn't. And I was like, wait, like, like it wasn't like, it was definitely not like a, a, no, it it was was, was rituals. Yeah. It was like, it was like with People celebrated Christmas and like uh, at least the, there was some uh, Christian students with us in the school. Yeah, and we thought how lucky he is because he skipped uh, Islamic. Yeah, school. so I remember I had the same thing. We see like there was one Christian class, and then I know that we we studied the Islamic, uh, like we studied the Quran, and they yes. didn't have to, and they skip a whole class. Yeah, and I know uh, we used to you're see lucky. them. You're lucky. Oh, you're lucky. Yes. Man. Yeah, <laughs> they're playing and running around, and like you're sitting down taking an extra and class. Eating and sandwiches yeah. and the window. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember that. Like, I remember that one girl. I was like, "Ah, oh, she gets that class off because she's Christian." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what what Christian means? Uh, no, oh, yeah. she's my friend, and yeah. and I lost contact with him, but he's my friend. Yeah, and around, in Basra we had Sabians too. Yeah. Like we we. In Basra there was diversity, like a lot of diversity. Yeah. Now where is it? I don't know. I haven't been. I have. I left Basra on one day. <laughs> no, no, no. The, yeah. There are no Christians. There are no uh, 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 Subba. Uh, Sabians. Yeah. Sabians. Mm-hmm. There are ev- almost everyone left. Yeah, it's you know. I I I I need to look into more of what's going on in Basra, but I haven't been. Uh, it's not fun. Yeah. The same guy who, now, for example, in this elections, the same guy who was responsible for for what happened in Basra in two thousand seven. Uh, Yusuf Snawi is now a candidate for this election mm-hmm. and he's a party he has a party uh, God's revenge party mm-hmm. the name of the party it's God's Gun revenge. revenge okay so <laughs> can you imagine how peaceful is that like you want to go you want to create a political system with a party called God's revenge <laughs> I mean, I mean, what are you doing? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're gonna have revenge, might as well be gods, you know, at this point. So, uh, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say, uh, I, I do want to touch back one more question that I have when you talk about the you wanted the I am skeptical of any help that comes to Iraq from the outside, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm, I feel like I'm justified to feel that way, and I feel like. You know, we, we need to be left alone more than, you know, helped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like we, we have a lot of people helping us right now. Um, and the reason why we're in this place in the first place is because we were helped to, like, either achieve freedom. That wasn't or, help. That's what I'm trying to say, but you're asking for more. No, no, that was, at okay. 2003, that wasn't help. But how do you no. know, how do you know this one is going to be different, though? It's like grabbing someone and saying, e- you, you have a headache. <laughs> I think you'll be better now. That was, that's fine. That's I, I, I completely agree. But what I'm asking you is how do you know that this time, the help... Because we are not asking the, America, the, the international community to invade. No, it's not like that. Okay. When that happens, we will stand against it. No, okay. We don't want any foreigners uh, to be on, on Iraqis. We want them to be as tourists. Okay. We want them to come as tourists, as friends, as... Uh, uh, workshops, whatever. We exchange everything. We want them, since this is their responsibility, this is what happens in Iraq now is, is in their necks in Iraq, we say that. Mm-hmm. They have to take their responsibility. Their responsibility is to create real democracy for Iraq. Who are they? Who the are Americans. You want to talk Americans. And the British. Okay. The people who invaded Iraq, especially. Okay. The American and the British. You don't think that the best option for them right now to just leave because it doesn't seem like they helped at all. No, because now they broke the door and they are leaving now and everyone will come. Okay. So it's very risky now. They have to stay at the door and make sure that they that this door is built very well and then they leave. Okay. I, on that, like we might have to disagree on that one, which is fine because I have a feeling that 
that door is going to be broken. If there's somebody to fix that door, I don't think, like, looking at the last, has it been 18 years? It has not been fixed. I feel like the door is going to have to, like, get in line with the electricity. But what they left at 2010, and we've, you've seen the result. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with you. If they left now, mm-hmm. I would say militias will take over and you will see Taliban, a new Taliban in Iraq. Mm-hmm. But now it will be the militias. But they can't stay in forever. No, no. Okay. I mean, there are bases everywhere in the world. Okay. And these bases somehow to... We don't want them to stay forever. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. But we want them to make sure that what they what they came to, to achieve, that they have to achieve. Thank you so much for speaking thank to me. Thank you so much for talking to Reason. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.